Okay, let us go ahead and get ourselves started with session 9 of 120B, 220B. Today we are going to dive headlong into structural systems and all aspects of structural systems. Everything from thinking about how we uh, just kind of conceptualize how to carry loads on down from the highest levels of your structure to the foundation through a lot of the details about how we model them effectively. And there are a lot of little tricks uh, as we go ahead and like uh, start modeling structures to go through and allow us to not only sort of convey what we want to happen from a design standpoint, but also to use them as analytical tools. So we'll go through and hopefully uh, get you set up for success as you start thinking about structures that will uh, be inside of your like uh, design center models or your integrated design project models. Um, in terms of where we are overall in the process, relative to the overall design project, Oh, if we were sort of tracking through a week at a time, first we were talking about just sort of your general ideas about the project and form and what it could look like. In week two, it was more about the passive design features and the building envelope, some of those different things, sort of in terms of how we're sort of relating to the outside world and uh, interfacing with it. You know, this week as we meet, the great place to be would be to sort of be thinking about, oh, I'd call it preliminary design complete. And by that I mean sort of your main spaces are where they are going to be, your understanding of the outer envelope in terms of where it'll be located, even if we're continuing to, continue to articulate um, what is window, what is wall, and change the materials, but it's pretty much in place. Your, your stairways are sort of where they belong, your restrooms and your mechanical room are sort of where they belong. But at some point, a lot of things are marginally pinned down just because as we start putting in all these additional systems and adding more detail to it, if things keep moving around, it just gets really complex to always be undoing and redoing. So your structure is probably in pretty good shape. We'll try to verify that with you when we all meet this week. And if there's anything that needs to change, you know, there's always going to be this trade-off in your mind about whether you go back and change it or whether you sort of say, hey, I had a great idea. I didn't quite get it in. I'll include it into a future generation of the project. You know, sort of there's this whole thing about how far you want to keep on going back because it really is a pretty big project and to try and maintain it all to the level of completeness as you continue to make discoveries, you know, maybe a lot of work for you depending on the scale of your structure. So uh, try and get them looking fairly complete. In terms of check-ins, let me check in. A lot of did you say that you had posted some times for like yes. uh, check-ins? Um, I have times listed for 3:30 to 5:30 and half-hour slots on Wednesday. Oh, very good. So tomorrow afternoon. Excellent. Okay, I am going to post my times too, and it'll be somewhat similar in terms of what's going on. So if I go over to the calendar and kind of check this out and I go over to scheduler. So what do we have in here? I see some nice slots available tomorrow afternoon just waiting for the taking. What we'll do is we'll go through and add to this too. I'll put in some more slots probably starting around noon tomorrow is when I'll get up to campus um, and sort of fill some things in for some of the afternoon ones. If you're signed up for those we can probably do it together and then we'll also put some in on Thursday again. So there'll be some more slots but if any of those are appealing to you go ahead and jump on in there and get yourself signed up both for our folks here as well as our folks who are um, doing it remotely because that's actually turning out to be a lot of fun. It's, it's kind of interesting meeting people through Skype all the time and like uh, still continuing to collaborate. So see if you can get yourself signed up for a time. Okay, this next week, what we're gonna be focusing on is really starting to put in the structural framing elements, just really trying to get that articulated in a way that we can sort of model how everything's gonna to hang together and support the structural loads. We'll talk a lot about that today. And the following week, we'll get into actually doing some analysis on all those so that you can actually size things appropriately and confirm that it's actually the members you're putting in there and the space you're allowing are adequate for carrying the loads on down. Okay, as usual, just gonna keep on posting things to your design journal, and that's kind of where we are there. For the little unit-wise exercise for this week, that's published now too. Again, always be thinking about spending you know, an hour or less doing it, something like that. It's due next Thursday, and what it is is actually just to go through and do a little structural framing. So before we get to the complexity of your model, if you want to just sort of practice just modeling skills and getting used to like how the different pieces fit together, what you can do is, what, if I go back over to the workshop, 
Take a look out there at assignments. This is something that you might even complete in class today. You say, under structural systems, what you want to do is go through and just create a... That's oh, interesting. Why did it not... I updated some things in there. Ah, there it is. A little page caching. Okay, go through and you're going to create a basic little uh, 20 by 50 structure. As we think about 20 by 50, that probably only has like two bays. It could have three bays. Just like, it's a very small little structure. There's nothing elaborate about this. It's just to give you some experience sort of playing around with different structural framing systems. Model it in two of the different systems, steel and timber, steel and concrete, concrete and timber, whatever you prefer, just to get some experience modeling the different uh, types of systems. And for this, be sure to include some grids, some structural columns, some beams on those columns, some floors, and finally some foundation elements. So it's pretty straightforward. By the time you get done with it, you will probably have something that looks sort of like that little unit example I opened in class last time, where it really just has, oh, let's even go back to that just to kind of give you an example. It probably looks something like that where here I have it all modeled and it looks like this is the steel frame version of it. It's a little bit bigger than what we're asking for, but the idea is really just to give you some experience putting down some grids, laying the different elements in there, and just kind of hooking it all together. So especially if you were in like a, the A class and you do this part of the A class, it'll be boom, boom, boom. You should have no trouble kind of like really kind of banging that out. For people who weren't in the A class, please help them. <laughs> because it's kind of hard to jump in and uh, like, oh, like we're throwing around all this stuff and it's, uh, there's a lot of little hidden gotchas in the whole scheme of it. Okay, let's go back to the outline, wherever that went. Okay, if we start thinking about structure, there's a couple of major issues we want to start talking about just to get us going. We talked a little bit about last time the whole notion of the relationship of your structure to your building envelope. So that's just this whole notion of where your walls and the wall surfaces are going to end up relative to the structure. And just to start thinking very you know, carefully about that in terms of the relationship you want to have. It often has to do a little bit with your structural system itself in that depending upon your structural system, um, different relationships to the walls are sort of invited by the different types of systems. So for example, if I go through and let me go, I can rev it and I'll just open up, well here's the steel frame system, let's start with that one. If I go to the floor plan view and I start thinking about kind of the columns, which are going to be supporting the second floor. I could have different things supporting my second floor, whether it's going to be the columns, it's going to be some walls, it could be some of each. But if I start thinking about my walls and how they're going to be related to those columns, there's a number of different relationships we could have. This is where we sort of left off last time. A very uncommon relationship to have would be, oh, let me do brick on metal studs. A very uncommon relationship would be wall center line. This sort of relationship, uh, you don't see the walls, because I need to, need to turn that over so it is going to say coordination, okay. Would be quite odd to go through and have something like this because if I go through and shade it and I turn up the resolution, you'll see what's happening is I sort of have that steel column kind of penetrating into the outer brick layer as well as into the inner layer. The column's all buried, that's kind of nice. It feels good that we're not gonna see the column, but this would be sort of a very messy sort of construction detail. That would feel really, really weird to try and do that. It would involve a lot of cutting in the field and trying to notch out the brick and all those sorts of things. So a much more common relationship when you're doing steel structures is to think about there being a structural core and then a, layer, a number of layers of finishes on top of that core for this particular wall, okay, which is oh, made up of some metal studs with brick on the outside. The, what I think of as the layer which is the outside of the core is right where my mouse is, right there. There's an inner layer of the steel studs and some sheathing on the outside. A very common relationship would be to do more like this. We'd have, let me turn down thin lines just so you can really see what's going on here. I would typically go through and align and I'd go to the outer face of the steel okay, and align 
the face of the studs to that. See if this will work. Okay. That would be sort of a much more common relationship where the outer finishes are just wrapping around the outside. The inner part, as they go through and do the steel studs, they're gonna frame that up too close to the structural columns, kind of bolt it down to the floor <laughs> or clip it down to the floor. That should be in good shape there. But we have, in this case, I'd call it that the structure is on the inside as opposed to being you know, in line. Now, people sometimes wonder about situations like this. You see that kind of little funny column hanging out inside there. We don't even know what size that column will be. It might be even bigger than that still. But the column's hanging out of the inside, and that bothers people. You look at that and say, oh, I'm not going to like this. This is going to mess up my architecture to have these steel columns hanging around. Now, sometimes we like them because we sort of want a very industrial loft-like look. But if you want to think about those being hidden, the most common way to do it is people will take oh, something like just an interior wall, partition, everything in there. I don't really have anything in this file for doing that. I'll just do it with a generic wall then to get started. We'll go through and just in case the column with something that looks like that. And this is sort of a very common condition. If you go wandering through the professor's offices on the edge of the building, you'll find a lot of this, because this is basically the way our building's constructed. The steel sometimes pokes in, and well, a lot of times even in the hallway, you find these little funny bump outs, and you wonder what those little bump outs are about. And what they're doing is they're encasing a piece of steel that's wider than the thickness of the wall, okay? So that's kind of a really common relationship in steel structures, is to have stuff like that. Now, uh, not to say that's the only relationship you might have, because you can, let me zoom on out here, have other relationships too. You certainly could go through and put the wall so it's outside. Okay, just depending on where you want that to be. Typically what's going to happen in this case is we'll bring the floor right out to the structural boundary and we're going to clip the wall, the structural part of the, uh, the wall, to the floor. Okay? But the floor can often extend beyond the line of the columns. That's okay. If we do something like this and we have that exterior wall, what you have now is this column which is hanging out inside your space. And if you have a column hanging out inside the space, if you want a very industrial look, you can have the column in there. We might have to fireproof it and do some things so it may not look uh, quite so scenic. You can sort of see a lot of exposed steel really even above our head. You sort of see what it looks like to keep it all exposed. You can see the fireproofing on it, which is uh, guaranteeing its structural safety. It's not going to get weak in the event of a fire. So people don't always think of that as being very scenic. So very often what they'll do is they'll go through and put what's called an architectural column around that. Let me go ahead and load one of those in. I'll do a little metal clad column. Nah, I don't like that. I'll go round column. So what is an architectural column? It's really just a column which is going to encase the other column. Just give it a nice architectural finish. So it's a very common thing to do. Especially you'll find things like this, oh, in interior spaces where columns are sort of falling just right in the middle of space, if you don't want them to be all chunky and look like I-beams, you put some nice architectural finish around them and all of a sudden they look much, much better. Okay, so this is kind of a really common condition. You would also go ahead and, let me zoom out here. Let's go ahead, oh, I'll put another wall in the other direction here. And just trim that. A little off uh, kilter there, but I'm not gonna worry about that for right now. If I had gone through and said, and here's the reason for doing this, I should say. Um, if you think about the structure as being independent of the skin, then the skin could actually vary based upon the material properties you wanted to have. If you decide, for example, that, oh, in the corner, you would really like to have a nice big, you know, storefront sort of window opening that's a big curtain wall. We can change that. Okay, put the glass in there. In this case, hang on, it's hiding from me again. Because I'm in the structural file. 
we could have the glass wrapping around there, the structure is going to stand independently. And that's really the reason why on more large commercial structures we tend to separate the structural system from the wall system, thinking of the skin as being subordinate to the structure, that the structure holds, we have the flexibility to kind of adapt and change our skin based upon what we'd like it to be. But we can still go through and, for example, oh, not that column. I want the architectural column. be in there, okay? And that won't look so bad hanging out behind the glass, okay? Another sort of relationship, though, that you could also think about, which is certainly valid, is if I want to think about the walls being inside the columns, and what? We do this to really have the architect, or the, you know, this, what the structure stand out if we really want to see it. Sometimes we'll do this. We'll put curtain wall inside the columns. Then go through and put those architectural columns just outside. Okay. And that could be a nice look. Let's look it back in 3D. Let's flip it over. Where to go? I probably have to hi open, uh, turn on some things. Let's turn on columns and curtain panels. I have walls turned on. I have them turned on. But let me turn on the coordination view. Okay. So you can have those panels standing outside the glass. If you think about oh, a lot of uh, very modern international style structures, they did that a lot. They had the columns kind of standing quite independent of the glass skin. So in concrete or in steel structures, you sort of have this could go either way, which is sort of a very you know, flexible way of approaching it. If you're thinking about, oh, more of a concrete structure, let's take a look at that. I'll go back to session eight where I put these guys. Where do I have them in there? Some structural framing. Let's look at that concrete structure. Actually, you guys tell me, who's, who's from a place where they build most of the structures of concrete? OK. So Henry, if we were going to go ahead and kind of think about this concrete frame, you sort of see, oh, here's all sorts of concrete columns right now. How do they fill that in? How do they put a wall on that? What, what typically happens as, as, you know, as you see it? Uh, are you talking about the wall between the columns? Yeah, like how do they, how are they going to fill in, for example, between this column and that column? What do they actually end up doing? Uh, it's, um, it can be a monolithic pour. Okay, so we could pour concrete in there. If they poured concrete, would it be even with the outside of the columns, or would it be sort of, uh, you know, sort of in the middle, or does it matter? I mean, I've seen both, but uh, I mean, um, some uh, some people use. Uh, I mean, there's no specific level on the use of the, like, it's just, it's just like stone. Or mm -hmm. like, uh, it's kind of like a block with like uh, mm -hmm. six holes, and they fill that up with rebar. Mm -hmm. Or uh, it's usually, in, 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 in like, W Dubai, it's all also all concrete. Interesting. So, like, in so let's go ahead and think about some of these. Let me put the wall back in here. They, the other uh, studs aren't really used. Yeah, I oh, know, it's, it's exactly. It's a very different kind of system there. Let me shade this. It's like all heavy and... Uh, yeah, so we could fill it in by building a concrete wall that typically is flush. The reason we tend to actually sort of flush things like this up is if I shove that in just a hair, I then have this really funny ledge that starts catching water and dirt and grime and all sorts of stuff like that. So it is kind of nice to have things flushed on up like that. But there's a lot of ways of going through and doing this. Another sort of very common scheme is, oh, in parts of the world, they'll fill it in with like a block or a brick behind the surface, and then they'll put an outer surface, a skin, which is tile or some nice surface, or maybe coat the whole thing with stucco. But they'll sort of have the inner and then the outer skin. And if you want to think about doing something like that, oh, if I go to the walls, Oh, uh, the one that's probably closest to it here is called brick on CMU. So the concrete masonry units or the concrete blocks, they're the inner core. They're going to rest on top of the concrete slab and be the backing. And then the brick is either tile or brick or stucco on the outside. 
You can do something like this. And the way I would usually place that is I'll say core face exterior and then line it up like this. So what happens is it's again very similar to the steel. We have the concrete column with a slab edge going right to the edge of the concrete column. Then we have the concrete masonry units filling in. And then on top of that, on the outside, we put something, you know, whether it's an insulation, some brick, whatever the outside surface is. And you know, again, a very common way of doing it. So the difference is really, as we think about a system, here we have a heavy mass sort of wall, as opposed to metal studs, which is a very light frame wall. But on the outside, you know, whether that is stone panels or brick, the skin is really just a separate layer that's on top of it all. So even for concrete, the most common thing with concrete typically is to go ahead and have it sort of come right out to the outside edge of the structure, have that match up, and then something come beyond it. At least that's the way I tend to see it a lot. Okay, so concrete, you know, I don't know, it's again not all that different. It sort of has a little bit of an implication about how you want to place things, and it really gets to just the relationship before, between where you want to think of the structural boundary and then the thermal boundary or the, uh, the weather boundary. Okay, so questions about that, or does that sort of feel good? More or less? Actually, as you guys are thinking about your structure, let's, let's kind of just survey the room. Yeah, so, so Brittany, as you think about your structure, what kind of structure do you think it'll be built out of? Is it going to be sort of a steel, a concrete, a wood, or what kind of scale do you think? Yeah. I don't know. I think the, the bedside, I think wood. Mm -hmm. But then the, all the curvy ones, I'm not really sure yet. Okay. Very good. As you think about wood, why do you think about wood for, she has kind of like several pavilions. Why, why do you think about wood as opposed to like concrete or steel? Um, over the bedside. Complicated, you don't have a lot of things jutting out in weird places that you need the extra yeah. support for. Okay, very good. Often, sort of what I'll call domestic scale buildings get built out of wood. It's just sort of a very simple you go down to Home Depot, put a load on the truck, you know, no cranes, no heavy equipment, a lot of nailing, and you can kind of make it work. It's sort of an easy to use material. But it actually sort of has a limitation. Does anyone know? If you're building something out of wood, how high can you build it? Like, okay, you can build a one-story structure. Can you, can you build two stories? Okay, three? Four? Yeah. Jacqueline's looking, she's, she's thinking about this now. What do you think? Is four okay? Um, it can, but it's not really that good. Oh, very good. I think, yeah. And why is it not so good? You're, I think that's a, that's a very sensible answer. Because I know there's a limit. You just have to do with fire and stuff like that. But what, why is it, what, what's, what's the other, one problem is fire. No one likes a like 10 story building to burn down or something like that. I don't like any burden, building to burn down, but that's, that's asking for trouble. All right, what's, what's, what are some of the other reasons? Why structurally wouldn't you want to do it? Um, I'll say the jet. Ah, very, very good. So my concrete structure, even my steel structure, it's pretty rigid. So like when the earth or the earthquake, it's not really moving very far. However, wood, oh, it kind of it sways with the trees. And that's not necessarily, on the first floor, one story, two story, you can handle that. But you know, 10 stories up, that's not so good. OK, so you have the drift problem. You actually even have the deflection sort of problem in that you know, wood naturally just kind of it shrinks over time. We have engineered wood, which doesn't shrink so much. But sort of the more weight you have on it, it compresses more than concrete does or more than steel does. So as things get bigger in scale, we tend to start moving to these stiffer just systems. They're kind of more painful to build with. You need heavy equipment and you have a lot more e external dependency. But yeah, it kind of moves to this bigger scale and everything gets, gets more complex all of a sudden. So I'd say for your simple one-story veterinary structure, wood makes a lot of sense, okay? But you know, even, I'm thinking, Christine, what am I thinking? For like this two-story lofty sort of thing, what are you thinking? I was thinking steel, maybe concrete. Okay. Very good. At that scale, I could say you go either way. It almost depends just on the feel of what you want. We have a lot of kind of buildings, even in San Jose, where they'll build concrete at the lower level, then they'll build wood at the higher levels. Yeah, just kind of all sorts of variations. 
Like Sang Chai, as you think about your building, what are you thinking about, you know, relative to your center? Mm -hmm. Very good. You're sort of at a scale that feels bigger. Okay. Yeah, very good. How about Gustavo for your, because you have that ex existing brick exterior sort of on the inside. Do you think it's mostly framed up with wood or what do you think is actually, what supports the floors in there? Uh, I've seen some wood, but I think I'm going to go with concrete. Okay. And, oh, well, actually, tell us about it. You, you have experience on some of the camp buildings on campus in terms of, like, so tell us about putting a concrete shell inside of, like, an older brick exterior. Uh, well, you can reinforce the brick with, like, sharp brick walls. And that's what they did at Old Camp. And that's nice because you don't need forms. You just, like, shoot the concrete off to the existing brick and it just, you know, finish it there. Okay. It's kind of a ideal way to do it. Yeah. And, and why, why are we doing that to Old Kim? What's the problem with Old Kim? Because it's, it's got that sandstone. It's, it's been hanging out for years and years. Well, up until 1989. Yeah, it's been unoccupied for the last 30 years. And what's really happening is that the Shot Creek wall is holding up the brick or the sandstone. Mm -hmm. So they have like dowels at every 30 feet that are holding in the sandstone. Old Kim, it's by the oval. It's by the, yeah, at the front of the quad. You may not have seen it. It's, it's been closed for so many years. It's kind of hanging over by the art museum, sort of. But actually, they did this to almost all the buildings in the quad. There's, it, you see the sandstone exterior, but now it's really just a skin. It's not providing much structural support. They've actually built these concrete shells inside and kind of restuck the sandstone back on the outside to create that appearance. And even some people are sort of surprised. Like, you know, when people walk up to the Y2E2 building, do they see a lot of steel or do they see a lot of stone? They see a lot of stone, but it's fake stone. It's only about like two inches thick or something like that. It's actually a big steel frame building that's coated in a veneer of stone. Okay, so yeah, different systems for different places. Hey, Jacqueline, for your, your building is quite enormous. Okay, uh, yeah, so like what kind of system are you thinking about? What, what makes sense in Hong Kong to build with? What do they tend to build with in there? Steel. More steel? Yeah, but I think I'm thinking of like more composite such that I can have yeah. But mainly, I think structurally it'll be Okay. Very good. Actually, so Henry, why do they build with concrete in Lebanon? Why? Because it's, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, it's a really good question relative to sustainability. Why do you think they do it there? Uh, as opposed to building steel? You know, I'm actually not sure. Uh -huh. I think it might be price mm -hmm. and uh, labor, labor expertise. Okay. Very good. Oh, that's certainly a big thing. Uh, so, yeah. But, uh, because the climate's like here, so I don't know how what are the energy applications. Yeah, but it's, um, it's, it's certainly got more thermal mass. So maybe in a hot weather climate, it's helping to shield us from the heat and kind of hold the heat and kind of level it out like a battery a little bit. I mean, yeah, yeah but the thing is also when where it snows, they also it's also concrete. Yeah. Right. Or like they use, I don't know if it's concrete, it's like a block. Yeah. Like concrete like, uh, blocks of some type. I don't know if it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, yeah, it has like holes. It's yeah. like six holes, and two, two by yeah. three, and they, they just stack it on top of each other. Yeah. But uh, it's like a weird, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I don't know. I think labor expertise and bread. I, I think uh, you're you're actually on to it in terms of what really does it, because even in most of the places where you'll you'll see whatever the the conventional building processes, it tends to be what's readily available, what do a lot of laborers know how to work with, because you'll get a better price if you use a very familiar technology. Whenever you start using a technology that's unfamiliar or requires special equipment, it sort of drives the cost up. Okay, so very often we go with what's familiar. In, in a lot of parts of the world, concrete's considered a very accessible yeah, material. Like when I was traveling in India, I was amazed. You know, they didn't even have concrete pumps. People were carrying concrete around everywhere, either over their head or in wheelbarrows. Or it's amazing, yeah, what they do. If you have a lot of labor available and equipment's very expensive, like moving giant steel beams takes a big piece of equipment. You can't just hoist that up with five guys. So there's always this trade-off. There's also a sustainability trade-off. Well, this is kind of a funny one. Everyone who was in Mike's class, yeah. Is, is there a definitive word as to whether uh, wood, steel, or concrete is more sustainable? No. No. We, we, we could debate this for the next few weeks or something like that about really which one's more sustainable. Kind of depends on where you draw the boundaries. 
So, okay, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so concrete, steel, wood frame buildings are a little bit different, although they still follow, I still think, a very similar principle. I do a lot of wood frame buildings just because I do a lot of residential construction. So if I was thinking about wood frame buildings, again, I have all in this build or wood frame buildings a bunch of four by six columns. Okay, an interesting thing about four by six columns is if you have two by four or four by six or two by six walls, you know, you might actually have things line up perfectly with the columns. Okay, so what are these? These are currently sort of four by eights. So a very kind of common type of construction with wood frame construction is, let me see if I can find anything that's close. Don't see anything that's exactly like it, but I'll make one. We'll make a wall type. I'll just call this uh, two by four stud wall. Yeah, it'll be like three and a half on the inside in terms of uh, that structural framing layer. As I go moving towards the outer side, I'll probably have some sort of plywood sheathing in here. Let me change that to plywood. That might be a half an inch or eighth of an inch, something like that. Okay. Uh, that's kind of a sheathing layer. Oh, on the outside of this, I should probably go through a substrate layer. I should have some sort of finish layer, so I'll go through and put some sort of a finish out here. Uh, what do I got in here, like siding or stucco or whatever I have out there? Diving in there? I'll do siding. It's about an inch thick. Maybe a little bit less. And finally, I'll put a layer on the inside. I'll move that on down. Okay, this will typically be gypsum wallboard or something like that. Okay, and if I put a half inch in there, I'll make that a finish layer also. Okay, so this very kind of uh, common sort of construction for walls and you no, know, just sort of simple structures um, could, oh, let me go ahead and draw this. Let me do my visibility graphics. I'll turn on the walls. I think the walls are already turned on. Yep, they are. I have to change it so it says it's a coordination view. Structural plan right there. Maybe turn this up so it's a little finer. So in the same sense, what we'll tend to do is put the walls in, but once again, that sort of finish of the core, the core exterior tends to be a very popular spot because if I go through and put that wall in, I'm going to shade that for you. If you do, do it right, the columns end up right in the center of the wall in line with the other framing, the sheathing's on the outside, the interior finishes on the inside, so you have a nice relationship between all those things. So. Even though with wood frame walls, you'll sort of think about them being in line with the structure, it's in line in a special way. You really want it to be in line so that the core face and the face of the studs all line up with each other, because that makes it very easy. When it comes time to put the plywood and the siding on, they don't have any little bumps and things to kind of cut out or work their way around. So it's different ways of sort of thinking about placing it. It doesn't have to be this way but those are sort of common relationships. Okay, as you go looking at these different uh, kind of structures though, because I have all these different structures, you might notice something about the grid lines I've put down. Okay, where are the grid lines? Are they located on the walls? Are they located on the columns? Okay, so are they centered on my walls or are they centered on the structure? Go back and check another one. I hear, I hear him whispering it. Almost always, 
we go through and put the grid lines on the structural elements, and then we sort of specify an offset between the grid lines and where the wall is, something like that. And that's just sort of a really common relationship to have. And the reason we like to do that so much is this. If, for example, halfway through the design, you decide that you want to move a grid line, okay, the structure moves with it, okay, which is nice, because then as things change, if somehow you're in the dynamo class and you decide to optimize your structure and you change the length, the, if the um, elements are placed on the grid lines, the grid lines move, then everything sort of stretches and resizes itself automatically. Okay. That's enough about placement. Let's actually start talking about oh, some of the high levels of creating the models and how to like go through and kind of create structural models relative to your architectural models. But just kind of keep in your placement strategy and your material in mind because it'll make a difference. Okay, if we start thinking about the requirements, what's really determining what we're trying to do? There's really two big types of load systems we are trying to work with. There's gravity load systems and lateral load systems. And for both of these, there's always oh, goals and sort of what type of elements carry them. So examples of gravity loads are oh, the dead load of the material itself. That's a gravity load. It's heading towards the ground. The live loads, typically us, people, equipment, things that move around inside. But also there's all these kind of transient loads like uh, snow, rainwater, all those sorts of things are kind of, again, pushing down. Some are there, we consider to be there all the time from a design standpoint. Others we sort of consider to be there kind of potentially at some time, a little harder to predict. Okay, and what we're trying to do just in general is just keep those things from moving down. So one thing is don't let it move, sort of keep it up where it wants to be, or if it is gonna move a little, don't allow it to flex or deflect too much. Okay, so a lot of the design we're doing is really based on the notion of A, just don't fall, and B, even if you're sort of flexing a little, don't deflect too much. So for every beam system, whether it's a simple beam, kind of the deflection in the middle, or a cantilever beam, the deflection at the end, we have levels of what we consider to be comfortable and safe, and when we exceed those levels, it gets a little uncomfortable. Okay, so we have these criteria that sort of guide us, and ultimately, What's going to happen is we're going to choose member sizes to go through and make sure that those things don't happen. So we'll choose them to make sure nothing breaks, nothing shears off, and ultimately it doesn't deflect too much. Okay. But we're going to go ahead and start by sort of assuming some different things and using our best engineering judgment and intuition to approximate where things belong and then go back and do some analysis to figure out precisely the size that needs to be there. In terms of the types of elements that we are using on the gravity side, you have the roofs and floors, which collect loads, the big collector planes. We transfer the loads down through either the columns or the walls, and ultimately, when they hit the ground, they need something to resist those loads. We call those the bearing elements, and it's typically some sort of foundation, either an isolated element under a column, or some sort of a strip footing or a pad under the whole building. So, if I'm looking back at Revit relative to all that stuff, we have these big old collector planes. Those are going to be planes where all the loads kind of come. We get the area loads. We have to bring them down somehow. So this is all shown as bringing it down by columns, but it could be a combination of walls too. So you have a lot of concrete walls or structural walls. Those could be carrying down quite a bit of load also. But down here at the bottom, we need these. We need these little sort of footings because we have all that load coming down on that isolated point. If we just put that directly to the earth, we'd have a failure there. So we need to spread it so that, oh, if this is 10,000 pounds, and simple like rules of thumb, if it's 10,000 pounds of the soil were 2,000 pounds per square foot bearing capacity, we'd say that we need five square feet of footing to go ahead and spread that load across and make sure that it doesn't have a little puncture failure right there. So super. On the other side though, we have lateral loads. Let's talk about those. Those are the ones that are particularly interesting to us here in California, as well as well, in a lot of parts of the world where either you have big seismicity or you have big wind loads you have to worry about. So we have all the earthquake loads, we have the wind loads. Let's kind of talk about that. It's sort of 
know, which, which one dominates? Okay, so if you think about like being here in Northern California, which do you think causes more trouble for us? Wind loads or seismic loads? Okay, generally that's true, okay. Uh, that if things are actually relatively low to the ground, okay, the seismic loads definitely dominate. But a funny thing happens when you start having tall towers. As soon as you start having the tall tower, the loads up near the top actually start becoming the dominant force, which is, you know, we have to design them for both criteria. Ultimately, we're going to figure out which is the worst, okay, but it's usually a combination of those two. For there, we want to make sure it doesn't fold over and it doesn't move sideways. And we're going to try to carry those using a couple of different elements. So in our buildings, we're going to think about how to carry the wall loads down. We're also going to think about some lateral elements we're going to put in there, whether they be sheer walls, which are often on the exterior. We put some sort of a strong wall in there to kind of keep things from pushing sideways. Okay, we'll want some kind of heavy duty element like concrete in there. Uh, or something that's not going to allow it to deflect. So we'll put them either at the exterior. A very common strategy is if you have a building and you have a core of the building, we'll put concrete all around the elevators and around the stairs. That'll be, again, to provide a core that's preventing and uh, providing some lateral support. If we can't put sheer walls, we'll often put in braces. Let me kind of just draw some little pictures here. Kind of illustrate this. Zoom on out. Okay, so what I'm suggesting is if we can afford to go through and put a wall in, what we may do is actually just right in here, go ahead and make a section of that wall and just make that a nice solid concrete wall. So much for my hatching. Okay. And that'll actually provide a lot of lateral resistance that keeps that from moving. If we can't go through to do that, we often do something like this. You'll see steel members, which do that. Okay, which are acting as braces. Okay, that's again gonna provide just a little bit of lateral resistance and rigidity to keep it from folding over. Okay, and if we can do that, that's typically our second strategy. If we can't do that though, and every once in a while we want one, Dad can't do that, actually let's talk about why you wouldn't want to do that. Let's say your structural engineer came back and said, you want this. Okay, we need to support that. Okay, why would, might you not want that? As you're looking at that, and you see those structural members kind of hanging out there in the frame, you know, why might you object to something like that? Yeah, if you have some big old window behind that, you say, hey, that's my view of the lake. What are you doing that for? Okay, so that's a very common battle that we get into. In that case, if I can't go through and put the big old cross braces, we'll get into something that looks more like this. We'll take this side over here, we'll take this piece over here, and that piece over there, and we'll do all sorts of welding and bracing right here at the corners, and we'll make a rigid frame, and that'd be called a moment frame, okay? And that's the other strategy we use. Moment frames have the advantage of sort of keeping everything open and clear so it's not blocking anything architecturally. The disadvantage is they involve a lot more fabrication, a lot more welding, a lot more sort of very precise work. So it tends to be an expensive way of doing it, okay? but. It's available. So for all these things, you gotta know for most of the structural things, there's all sorts of rules of thumb, but you can do almost anything you want to if you're willing to pay for it. It's really all a matter of just, uh, you know, trying to find the right balance between your budget and like uh, what you're trying to achieve. But so you gotta balance your architectural desires and what you're trying to create socially versus and aesthetically versus the structural performance, okay, versus your budget and the construction schedule, and that's where the art of this kind of comes in. Okay, enough of all that. Okay, let's finish up with one last thing, then we'll take a break, and that is to look at just different ways of kind of carrying things down. So, there's a bunch of different strategies we can use, and you know, I want to sort of just kind of pull a lot out of the table before we dive in, because I want to kind of encourage you to think broadly about ways you can approach this. 
Yeah. There's a lot of buildings which are like this. I'll call these simply framed buildings. And if I zoom on up, oh, they're sort of easy to spot in the, yeah. If I show you that building, can, can you picture where the structure is? You can almost sort of see the structure. It's you know, going to be a series of, oh, in this case, it's a bunch of tubes that are coming together. But you can sort of imagine where that structure is relative to the skin. It's relatively simple about what's going on in the framing here. See, again, you can sort of see what's going on in this building. It's relatively simple framing. We have these two kind of big towers on the ends, which are like cores. Okay, but between that, it's probably a lot of plates and different columns that support the plates and you know, fairly straightforward about what's going on. We will distinguish that from this sort of strategy. Let me zoom back out again. Okay. Arches are kind of a really fun strategy and whenever you have things which are mostly compression loads. The idea of carrying down things as arches, these continuous surfaces with the curves, as opposed to putting a lot of columns in there, is something to consider. This is sort of another nice way, um, especially, well, we'll talk about some shell buildings, which are sort of a 2D variation on an arch or a 3D variation of arch. Arches are a really good way of kind of bringing things down, as long as you could always have a lot of compression working for you. Okay, they're sort of a very efficient way, and we've been using them historically, we've been using them in more modern structures. Shells are almost a variation of an arch just carried out to 3D. That one in the middle is actually called Kresge Auditorium back at MIT. Um, that's actually like a thin shell structure where there's basically the whole roof is supported on three points and it's curved in such a way that it's like you know the thickness of an eggshell. It's a very thin shell structure, but everything comes down, just the shape of the curvature actually carries things down in compression down to those point loads. It's actually like Seng Chai, as I think about your leaf roof, I wonder about whether we can do something like that in terms of supporting something, you know, what it's doing. It's kind of more of a thin shell. Uh, that's a nice building, a little opera house there. Shells can be very fun and dramatic. So, and the reason I sort of show these buildings is, you know, just if you think about the drama and the apparent, you know, just the visibility of the structural system in these sorts of buildings, as opposed to those sorts of buildings, you know, here we're actually doing things where the structure and the structural form is very visible and being featured very prominently as an architectural artifact, as opposed to just sort of being hidden under a skin somewhere. So I like you to think about buildings like that. There's the ever popular, if you can't put it on the inside, put it on the outside strategy. So Place Pompidou in Paris was one of the first buildings that sort of turned a building inside out. You can sort of see just the structural skeleton as well as all the mechanical systems hanging out on the outside. Here we have in Hong Kong. I always call it the Hong Kong Bank building, but am I wrong? It's, 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 it's uh, I'm trying to think what the name of this is. It's the one near the Shanghai Tower. This is the Norman Foster building. I'm trying to think. The Yes. I thought it's, you call it Hong Kong Bank, Yeah, and I think it's wrong. Is it right? Okay, it's been changed. That happens a lot. <laughs> okay, but this one, if you can sort of see what's going on there, you almost can look at that building as being like a bridge. It's a series of bridges on top of each other where you got the two different towers and you have these kind of cross braces. I have some really interesting pictures during the construction where they really built the towers and almost slid in the modules between the two. It was really quite an interesting building. A lot of people now like to play around with structural skins, so diagrids or sort of structural systems where they're integrated in line with the facade system. Okay, so a couple different diagrids. All these organic forms, Frank Gehry loves his organic forms, so you sort of see the Bilbao and uh, the Disney Concert Hall. What's happening here though is the structural skins, or the skins really aren't carrying the structure. Underneath all that, there is a fairly conventional structure with a lot of sticks, and that skin's kind of hiding the whole thing. Okay? But this in some ways is the same sort of technology that's used to do this. It's sort of like putting the mountain on the side of the building. It's just uh, at Disney. It's the same sort of issue where you sort of have the main core, then you have to go ahead and try and support all the fins that are flying to kind of create the architectural form. Okay, 
I always like to think about suspension structures because if you can't support it from below, you could always consider hanging it from the roof. And that's something never to forget. That's actually sort of a very useful strategy is that if you're tired of having columns in the lower space and you want to keep things quite open, you might actually just sort of hang something from the roof instead. So this is Dulles Airport in Washington. You see it's actually supported by these big columns at the back and the front. And that whole roof is like a thin concrete shell that's hanging between the two. So there's no interior columns there. It's kind of interesting. This is uh, the airport in Denver. Okay, I'm always a fan of cantilever structures. So whether you want to talk to me about falling water and the big cantilever of the balconies or check out the cantilever on this one. I just sort of like cantilevers. There's something about just the apparent, uh, hmm, how does that thing actually float up in the air, which creates a real kind of excitement to the building. Now, in this cantilever, oh, let me zoom on in there a little bit. There's, things, there's all sorts of things people do to kind of make the cantilevers look even bigger. Come on down over here. Like, in the falling water photograph that you see there, you see that the, everyone knows the cantilever. That part's okay. okay. What a lot of people don't notice about it, though, because it's sort of hidden very well, is even the cantilever gives a little help. You see these things right here? There's actually these little concrete struts which kind of come up and help support the cantilever. So the cantilever isn't quite as long as you think it is. Okay, but it's sort of well hidden from you. Okay, with cantilevers, the big issue is I can go ahead and have the plank coming out and I have all the load coming down here. So the question is, how do I resist that? And that's what all this is about. Is there's a lot of weight back there that's basically keeping that thing from rolling over. Okay, so always watch out for cantilevers, and if you kind of look around, you usually figure out how they're supported. Even this one, okay, you can sort of see what's going on. It looks like most everything seems to be supported just back over here, and it may be. That. That's actually most of what's supporting that. There's a little bit of action happening down in here. I'm not sure if that's just for escalators or something going up. Okay. But it might be. It could be that it's actually carrying, so, uh, hiding a little bit of structural support for it. Now, as you think about something like this, and you think about this big beam coming out there, the question is, do you think that's actually like a big beam that's cantilevered out that far, or is the structure actually hiding in another place here? Okay, it could be a beam. So what do you know about beam design? Would that be an easy beam to design, or what would tend to happen on a beam that that's, long, that's that long? What's that? Ah, so Mr. Henry has an interesting idea. I have all this load coming down. Where, where could the truss be hiding? Any ideas? It could just be that it's in the lower layer here and there's kind of a shallow truss there. But what happens in a lot of buildings these days is we'll actually come up and say this whole thing is a truss. And what'll happen is somewhere in here we'll break it up and there'll be some big diagonals that are sort of doing something like that. And that's what I'll call like a super truss. Okay, a lot of ways you can sort of sort of play with that. I'm not sure what the structure on this building does, but it's one of the options they had. Okay, this is a building I like. Does anyone know where this building is? It's actually a trick question. Does it remind you of any other buildings? Does it look like an exciting place? It looks like it's kind of at Tahoe. This, what's that? It's not at Berkeley, although it could be. It's interesting. It, this is actually a building that doesn't actually exist. This is only uh, in movies. This is, uh, <laughs> this is in the movie South, or North by Northwest, where Alfred Hitchcock, okay, who was actually a big fan of architecture, 
really liked the idea of a very daring modern structure. He was actually a big fan of falling water and kind of some Frank Lloyd Wright's work, but he couldn't afford Frank Lloyd Wright, or Frank Lloyd Wright didn't want to work for what they were willing to pay. So just all the set designers, uh, I think it was at MGM, I don't think of the, the studio is, they basically came up with the design. So this is actually, uh, it's called the Van Damme House. It's actually very famous. People who are sort of architecture movie buffs like love this house because it really is a very interesting Frank Lloyd Wright type of house. But if you sort of look at what's going on even in this, they did a pretty good job of thinking about the engineering because what's happening is although it's cantilevered way out there, you notice it's not cantilevered as far as you think. It's actually supported right here. So what's happening is I got this big brace here and I have kind of a strut that comes back and holds it up. So even though there's an apparent large cantilever, it's not really as big as you think. So just lots of stuff going on in there. One more floating structure. This is kind of increasingly an interesting strategy where Oh, the edges of the floors just seem to float. And the key to making something like that happen is the columns are somewhere. The structural support is somewhere. It's typically just pushed in a little bit from the outer surface. But if you want to create the appearance of a floating building and have the drama of that, you can. Just pull your structure back in. Because it makes a big difference. How much, you know, how much more boring would it have been if you know, basically you saw like these things kind of coming down on the outside and it wouldn't have nearly the drama as kind of pulling that structure back and letting the little cantilever happen from all the different sides. So it's a lot of little tricks architects use to kind of allow them to do interesting things structurally. Okay, enough of all that. Let's go back to, oh, dynamic. Well, I have to see what's in there. Ah, check that out. This is sort of one of these things that, oh, people who think about uh, doing buildings that can parametrically deform think about, could you have building forms that dynamically change over time based upon uh, like the sun condition or some sort of climactic conditions? So these towers, almost think of them as being very regular towers that are just twisting around so the floors are having different orientations and kind of based upon some sort of external condition. So a lot of cool things to think about. I guess my message in this whole part is that structure doesn't have to be boring. Go ahead and have some fun with it and play with it a little bit and kind of try to find the creativity of kind of a very dynamic structure because I would venture that most of the really interesting architectural buildings actually have very interesting structures to them that are sort of very visible. Okay, let us do this. Let us go ahead and break ever so briefly. If you can come back in like five minutes, we will dive into Revit and kind of talk about linking models together and how we place the elements in the individual models and kind of think about how we could do a structure for a little sample building that I put together. Okay, so very useful if you're brushing up your structural skills and you haven't seen this for a while. It'll uh, get you going. So let me